Okay, start. So welcome everybody to this second webinar arranged by the ERA EDTA um, covering COVID-19. So my name is Kate Stevens and I am a nephrologist from the UK and I'll be moderating the session today. All our sessions are recorded and they're available on our website afterwards so you can look back at them and your colleagues who haven't been able to attend. I know the time is a bit difficult today. Um, this is to allow for the Singapore and Malaysian community to, to join us, um, but you can, you can look on, on the website later. So I'm delighted to introduce uh, Professor Christopher Banner, who is from Germany. Um, there's been a lot of interest in the COVID outbreak in Germany, I think not least because of their very low mortality rate. So Prof Banner is going to, to talk a little bit about the German experience of COVID-19. We're also expecting Professor Angela Wang from Hong Kong and Professor Adrian Liu from Singapore. Again, there's been an interest in the way that these two countries have managed the COVID-19 pandemic thus far. Now, Prof Wang and Prof Liu have not yet managed to connect with us, but I'm hoping if we start off with Professor Banner, then they will appear. A couple of basic housekeeping things. We will try and make this a little bit more interactive than our last session and allow you to ask questions yourself. So if you have a question, if you click on the raise your hand uh, button, we'd be happy to ask you to speak. When you're not speaking, if you keep your microphone muted, that would be uh, very much appreciated. Um, if you don't want to ask your question yourself, if you type it into the, the chat function or the Q&A function, I'm happy to ask it for you. Um, I don't want to be rude, but could we ask you not to type things into the Q&A or chat facility that are not relevant to the discussion? So um, we don't need you to, to say thank you or to say hello, just because it makes it difficult to um, identify the questions. Um, so thank you very much for that. So without further ado, Professor Banner, could we ask you please, um, I know you have an opinion about this, to maybe talk through what's happening in Germany and particularly why you think the mortality rate is much lower than in, in other places. Thank you, Dr. Stevens. Thank you, Kate, for inviting me. Um, I think we have quite good data and it's not only my opinion, we have now a national opinion about this. Okay. And uh, the explanation is that Germany learned uh, from Italy and discovered very early on that something is going wrong and Germany knows patient number zero. Uh, it was a lady in Munich infected uh, through a company, uh, a group of uh, 250 people. We knew this, we tracked all, we sent them into quarantine and we started a massive screening around this group and we call it in Germany the first cohort. Um, thereafter, these, uh, we had time to build up the screening and today we know already that we do on a weekly basis about 500,000 tests in Germany and uh, this is the maximum capacity, difficult to build up further, but uh, we try. So then uh, we learned in Germany that people are coming back from skiing holidays from Austria and Switzerland and uh, they may cause a problem and we use these massive screenings around these uh, re returners from skiing holidays. Uh, they were all young, sportive, and the first cohort and all these returning young people had a mean age of 48 years. At this time, Italy already had a mean age of above 70. So we, have, we had a different cohort. And these young people, sporting people, interesting, remained among themselves. Uh, they mixed with other young people and the infectious rate went up. Numbers in Germany went up to today 85,000. And early on, we had this mortality rate of about 0.2% which is unusually low. Usually it's known that this uh, coronavirus had 0.5% mortality rate. So actually the massive testing around uh, all the incomers, the carnival people, um, all young people uh, pushed the age down. They are good survivors when they are infected and we have a low mortality. This is changing now. Uh, today, I see uh, in the statistics that Germany climbed up to 1,100 infected uh, death, death mortality rate. And this is now 
a mortality rate of 0.8 percent. So we are coming up. We uh, will come in the same situation maybe than others. We now uh, identify a lot of hotspots in Germany, which are in old retirement homes, uh, which cause and they they really have a high mortality rate. We have several of these hotspots, and we come up uh, with the mortality rate. Uh, so it's actually two things: younger age and ma massive screenings. The time we had to prepare this explains in many eyes uh, uh, that uh, this low mort initial low mortality rate. So I think uh, I stop here for the first explanation. Okay, th thank you. So um, now there's, there's a lot of um, sensationalist headlines, but we had a headline recently which claimed that it was felt that Germany weren't testing enough, but you would refute that, would you? Uh, we uh, have a good statistics uh, from uh, the German um, Society of Laboratory Medicine, uh, which have uh, cover most of the testings in the broad area in Germany. And then we have all the specialized laboratories in universities. And the Berlin Charité uh, has an institute which collected all this information and they came up with initially 350 and now 500,000 testings per week. So we are pretty sure that this is, uh, that is the case. And, and not, we learned from Korea and looked how they are testing. And we were early on and we detected the many asymptomatic patients. Uh, in Italy, they just came too late. Uh, that's my, my quite uh, good guess. Okay, and um, do you think that uh, the German um, way of, of managing this is going to manage or is going to achieve a flattening of your transmission curve? So you, your services will not end up as overwhelmed as we've seen in Italy or, or Spain? No, we are afraid that this is changing now. We cannot control this situation anymore because it is spreading. You cannot track these massive amount of people now. And uh, that therefore, we cannot uh, go this way. We now have a hypothesis or, or a plan that we say we must test the, the, the correct people and not everybody, uh, the, the, the right, excuse me, not the correct, the right uh, people. And uh, this is also the strategy which we are now looking for uh, when we want to open up the quarantine in Germany. There must come the day and uh, there is a discussion around mm -hmm. which age ranges can go out of the house in the first place. Um, okay, so um, in Germany, in terms of a sort of lockdown, what, what's happening there? So in many other countries, including the UK, people are essentially not allowed out their, their houses. In Germany, have you currently still got a little bit more freedom than that? Uh, we have a federal republic and 17 lender are doing a little bit different things. Yeah, Bavaria started first and they lock people at home, allowing them only to go to work and doing outside outdoor sports uh, alone. So uh, streets are empty, the people are disciplined and we have permits to go to work. Uh, and um, actually on Saturday, Sunday, you find a lot of people outside in the, in the forest. And another uh, country in Germany, they uh, told them, their, their people, if you go out, uh, you cannot form more than a, a couple. Uh, three people are not allowed. You cannot sit down. Uh, you only move in, in, in the air. So a, a little bit variation exists in Germany, but more or less, we have locked down everything, uh, restaurants, uh, cinemas, and most of the shops, so similar to other countries. But uh, different to Italy, where we still can go out of the house uh, for outdoor activities. Okay, and um, we, we've had a lot of questions from our previous webinar, and again on this occasion, about the management of COVID-19 in the dialysis population. Now, um, I. I don't know how, how many of your dialysis patients have been affected, but what sort of measures are you taking in the dialysis units for infected patients? 
the German society uh, has established uh, nationwide rules with uh, some dialysis providers. Um, I was looking at them. They look uh, similar to what we have on the ERA ETTA website. So we have our national institute, uh, which gives recommendation uh, pretty much in line what many countries in Europe have. Uh, so, um, and the, the, the isolation procedures in dialysis units, or if we have a region, we identify one dialysis centers where we accumulate patients and keep uh, uh, some centers white. And, um, and this is uh, organized in the moment. The models differ a bit, but very, very intense. And leading is the German Society of Nephrology. And, uh, they um, are in um, communication with ERA EDTA through me and through RON and uh, Amsterdam Registry because Germany is in the moment uh, doing a different uh, registry. They try to build up um, a pragmatic one to get a lot of information in a short period of time because we feel that um, when a dialysis patient requires intensive care unit, and you have an age range limitation that the comorbid dialysis patient is the first one who gets triage. And we want to avoid this, that the triage is not extended to the younger ones who are on the transplant list and all the stories around this, uh, very intensively uh, looking at this issue. And um, uh, there is a lot of work in the German society and thanks to the president, Jan Galli, who is very engaged and bringing all the stakeholders, uh, which is the charity KFH, but also the dialysis providers, which is Fresenius, uh, B. Brown, all on one table to, or, to coordinate machines, supplies, and also organization of the of uh, dialysis patients, where to isolate them and how to handle them. So I, I think what you're saying is you're making a sort of national policy, and everybody is going to to follow the, essentially the, the same guidance throughout the country. Yes, and this works very well in the moment. Yes, absolutely, um, <clears throat> there's also been a, lo a lot of. Um, interest I guess in PPE so lots of countries have been feeling that they haven't got adequate supplies of PPE there's also been a lot of debate about what PPE people should be wearing so in the UK for example our um, so our patients who were not infected um, the, the nursing staff were simply wearing aprons and gloves and doing as they would normally with with visors um, and just recently that's been extended to wearing masks. So they're wearing masks when patients go onto the machine, they're wearing masks when patients come off, the patients are wearing masks, our patients are coming up in, in single person transport um, or being brought up by family members. Um, but masks, uh, it was only, um, I think on Tuesday that masks were introduced to our dialysis units for um, the patients. And I think that that's probably sensible and the feeling generally from everybody is that that's sensible because they're such a high risk group. Do Germany plan masks as part of your standard PPE in dialysis units? Um, there's a lot of confusion which has been solved. Uh, and in, uh, we have in Berlin a virologist, uh, Christian Drosten, who, does, uh, who has actually discovered SARS, uh, the first one, and published this in the New England Journal in 2003. So he's an authority. And this guy is doing um, a webinar every day, 40 minutes, uh, broadcasting across Germany and in 60 countries of the world where people speak German. And uh, this uh, broadcast is now in the 25th edition and has called 20 million times. And this guy explaining us in Germany the uh, confusion about mask, when to use and why to use. And this... Um, um, helped us to understand the inner hospital and outside hospital mask wearing in detail. And even um, our uh, cultural understanding in Germany is you cannot hide your face. Uh, you are discriminated. We don't do this. Uh, led to a change in understanding that now we produce our own mask at home uh, for 
a certain type of protection, yeah? not to bring your fingers always, uh, protect your neighbor when you are speaking, the droplets are um, in the half of the hospital um, and when to use um, FFP2 or a shield and um, this is regulated, I think in five issues regulation when and uh, this is on the website of the German Society and spread uh, of nephrology and spread among the dialysis units. And um, I think we have an understanding uh, on a very high protection level. And masks are shortage. There is a shortage. Every hospital has in the moment uh, a stock of about six days. Um, and uh, building up these six day stock is a disaster in the eyes of some people, but there's continuous supply uh, coming from elsewhere and yeah okay stop here okay um, so i noticed that angela and adrian have now joined us thank you very much both of you for um agreeing to, to take part um mm -hmm. prof anner has just been telling us about the german experience and the german plans for um managing the upsurge of cases of covid 19 um and as part of that he's um alluded to or he's been discussing masks and ppe and actually what's quite interesting is the difference in the rates of infection and the mortality in Hong Kong and, and Singapore. And some people are ascribing that partly to the fact that although the government aren't necessarily advocating it, 90% plus of, of the population in, in your countries wear masks regardless as a, as a hangover, a lot of people would say from, from SARS in 2003. I don't know, Adrian, if you have a, have a comment about that. Uh, well, it, not really in Singapore. We, we, we do not have a common practice of wearing masks. Um, but um, <clears throat> so before today, I think the government's uh, advocate was that uh, if you're, only if you're sick to wear a mask. And so this is actually to sort of uh, save up the stockpile of masks for the frontline uh, healthcare uh, providers. So for the general public, uh, the advisory was that if you are sick, um, then wear the mask. If you're not sick, there's no need to wear the mask. And that's what, this was in line with the WHO recommendation previously. Um, but I think today what has happened was that because we're starting to see that there was clusters of uh, community transmission and we um, have started to find that there were actually asymptomatic patients who might be infected. And therefore the government today has actually says that they are not going to discourage the wearing of masks. Um, so, so that's the, the situation um, as of um, that has progressed from previously till today. Um, I also I was um, I was having a look on the internet before we started this, and I, I see that um, your government's announced as well a, a lockdown in terms of your schools and workplaces closing. I think just today is that correct? Well, so today the the announcement was that uh, it's it's not really a lockdown. Essential services like markets. Uh, um, restaurants, um, uh, banking or transport are still ongoing. Um, in fact, uh, the companies are, are suggested to all work from home. So they are um, so, so the so-called lockdown is that a company to close and they, everyone will be doing telecommuting and they will work from home. The schools will all uh, be doing home-based learning. So the schools will be closed for a period of one month. So, but there's no restriction to movement as in you are allowed to go out of the house, but um, the advice is that to practice safe distancing and even for restaurants, they are advising no dining in um, and you should be only just you will be taking out and, and safe distancing while you are queuing up for your takeout. Okay, thank you. Um, so Angela, um, can I um, maybe invite you to tell us a little bit about the, the Hong Kong experience of COVID-19 thus far? Where is your face, Angela? Yeah, you'll need to unmute your microphone. There's a button at the bottom left of your screen. You just click on it on the microphone. Perfect. I can just see, see my face. We can see your face. <laughs> yes. Hi. So yeah. So um, you see, I was. I am going to show just a, a quick slide about the uh, latest uh, Hong Kong situation. Uh, where we now have 845 confirmed cases, 
but we um, and uh, only about 173 patients got discharged. Um, the the remaining are still um, in hospital mainly because their viral load is still uh, noted to be positive, so they weren't discharged. And uh, there are four mortalities, so which is about 0.47 percent. We actually had quite a low mortality. I've actually talked to our um, infectious disease colleagues and um, uh, we don't exactly know the reason, whether it is because of genetics or the treatment or um, maybe because our patients generally uh, present to the hospital rather early, like uh, soon after they have symptoms, they present themselves to the hospital. And, um, and we don't know, that may be one of the reasons why we had a rather low uh, mortality. And um, in terms of infection control, I think because Hong Kong does learn from the uh, SARS experience. So uh, it, it actually starting in January, because at the time we also have the Chinese New Year. So right near the, uh, soon after the Chinese New Year, everybody is already becoming very vigilant. And then we started to uh, wear masks. So in fact, our government is also encouraging us and promoting us to wear masks. And our government is actually um, advised by a number of, um, uh, you know, uh, leading uh, microbiologists, public health as uh, experts, and also uh, respiratory physicians. So um, I think everyone uh, had this uh, notion that we should be wearing masks. So in fact, even in January, I think 90% of the population is, is actually wearing a surgical mask. Uh, and so at one stage, we do have, um, you know, masks. Shortages. And now I think um, almost everyone is wearing masks. And um, the government is also uh, closing down the schools, you know, and us advise everyone to work from home, actually in January already. So I think that that also helps to uh, limit the spread. But, um, you know, for Hong Kong, the epidemiology of the COVID-19 also changed because initially it was mostly um, cases related to the Wuhan uh, uh, COVID-19 and then but um, since uh, the middle March onwards we are seeing a lot of um, uh, cases imported from uh, different parts of the world so I think the government is actually uh, doing even more stringent uh, approach for instance um, they have uh, put that as a as a, a legal requirement, you know, uh, where uh, people coming into Hong Kong, even if they are residents, they have to have forced 14 days quarantine. And also, um, in the last week or so, they started to uh, have everyone coming through the airport uh, to have this virus checked uh, at the airport. So they have set up centers uh, right next to the airport uh, to have the uh, COVID-19 checked, and uh, hopefully that can help to contain. The virus. So, in fact, we had a territory-wide um, policy, okay. uh, and I think that for one second. Sorry, can I just to clarify? So, in the airport, you're actually screening everybody that comes through for COVID nineteen. Now, yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. Okay. Okay. Now, yeah, they they have to, uh, yeah, but not earlier, you see, because no. I think the um, our microbiologists or the uh, microbiology lab also takes some time uh, to actually set up the, uh, you know, the the loads of tests that can be managed. Uh, within the 24 hours. But now I think um, there are people stationed uh, at the airport uh, be because now the uh, people coming in is actually a lot less because all the flights are cancelled. Most of the flights are cancelled. And um, I think we also are not allow people that are not residents to come into the, co uh, to the city. So um, for everyone who comes into the city, they have to be uh, Hong Kong residents and uh, everyone would go through this checking, um, you know, to do the deep throat saliva test uh, for the COVID-19, yeah, right at the airport. And sometimes I heard on the news, like it might take them up to nine to 10 hours to get the test results. And before then they have to stay at the airport. Yeah, okay. but I think this is a good strategy to try and limit the spread. And the other thing I want to say is because it was just announced on the news that they are um, closing all the bars as well because of uh, the pubs and the bars because uh, we recently had a few uh, outbreaks, small outbreaks relating to uh, people going, uh, I mean, visited the bars and uh, pubs. So I think the government is trying to do a lot of contact tracing. 
So there are a few things we do, like uh, government advising us to practice social distancing, uh, practicing hand hygiene all the time, uh, wear masks, and also they are, are actively doing contact tracing, um, you know, also screening people coming through the airport. And hopefully uh, we are able to limit uh, further spread because in the last uh, week or so, actually the case number is still um, not settling, you know. So every day we might have about 40 to 50 new cases a day. Okay, now you mentioned you had a slide you wanted to share? Um, I, I wonder whether I should show it or I can, I mean, uh, I can show it to you to see whether you think uh, I should show it because um, I just wonder, um, um, did you see my slide? If you just click the share button, we should be able to see it. Uh, it's at the bottom. Uh, at the bottom, let me see. Oh, okay. Um, did you see this? We do. Yeah. If you can, you make it a yeah. Can you make it a presentation so it's easier for everyone to see? Perfect. Um, so this is just to summarize. Uh, this is just to summarize, you know, the latest situation of COVID-19 for Hong Kong. And in fact, the uh, Center of Health Protection of Hong Kong actually did this regular update on their website. So this is the latest where we had 845 confirmed cases, four deaths, 173 being discharged. What we noted currently is that a lot of the patients are still shedding the virus uh, from the testing. Uh, so it's difficult to discharge them, even though they might appear clinically well. And so therefore the government um, is actually discussing where to, I mean, because the hospitals are all now filled up for the isolation uh, rooms. So we're trying to discuss whether uh, some of the uh, patients who have already received treatment with low viral theta, very stable case, can be stepped down to um, other, you know, other places. So to make room for the incoming new cases, because we are still having 40 to 50 cases a day. Yeah, although you're uh, given your proximity to, to China, it, it really is very impressive how how few cases you, you have currently. Um, that's because I think we uh, we have been uh, kind of um, trying to close the border uh, actually in uh, February. Um, but this is just off the record. Probably I'm not going to say uh, on, on online uh, shortly. Um, because there were some um, strikes by the medical people to try and um, stop the government, uh, you know, uh, I mean, to, to ask the government to stop the border, to put pressure on the government. So I think eventually um, most of the borders got closed except three because there are about 10 or 11 ways to go from Hong Kong to China. So um, eventually I think they uh, closed most of the uh, routings except three uh, you know, three channels from Hong Kong to China. But I think uh, that's why I, I think it's clearly important to actually practice all those, um, you know, uh, hands hygiene, uh, face masks, because um, as I'm showing you, the next slide is how the viral load. This is actually a paper from uh, China um, where they can record. I, can I again? So we said at the beginning, we are trying to make this a bit more interactive. And, and Prof. Vanner, I think, had something you wanted to pass comment on in the last. Slide. Yeah, uh, Angela, I heard uh, the word viral shedding. Um, we in Germany, we know that the virus is shedded uh, or excreted for approximately three weeks, but you yeah. cannot culture this virus anymore. It's not, not replicating anymore. So we think that if you are asymptomatic, you can be sent out of quarantine when the post, uh, the, when, when, despite a shedding virus. Do you agree? Well, you see, talking to our, I'm not a microbiologist, but you see, I was talking to our ID colleague, interestingly, and also the Hong Kong situation. We don't discharge these people until their RNA in the deep throat saliva was negative. Is everyone is worried. So in fact, they are doing the deep throat saliva RNA. And uh, if they are still positive, they generally would not discharge the patient. And that's why we had this backlog of cases in the hospitals cannot be discharged because patients might appear clinically well, yet their deep throat saliva are still uh, RNA positive. Um, so there is this difficulty in, uh, in, in discharging these cases back to the uh, community. And that's why at the moment, the government uh, with the expert team, they are discussing uh, putting these 
cases like um, you know like beyond two or three weeks with a low viral uh, uh, teeter. Uh, these cases they may put it uh, in another step down center. Sorry, Angela. So this what is do you mean? Something, yeah. Sorry, Angela. What, what do you about mean by Singapore? Uh, are you doing serology or are you doing PCR? P PCR. So what do you mean by titers? As, as in low no, viral? what I mean is the uh, viral, uh, you know, the, um, the, how to say, the, the viral load, you know, they using the RT-PCR, then you can do the CT values. So the, the viral load, is, is that what yeah. you mean? Yeah. Yeah, we're, we're doing the same. They in are doing also antibody, but they don't use the antibody. I was talking to the ID colleague, they don't decide on discharge by looking at the antibody. Rather, everyone is doing the RT-PCR. Yeah, well, I agree. So in Singapore, we only discharge patients from the hospital if the uh, PCR is negative times two. And so for the patients who are well and asymptomatic, um, they are actually stepped down to the community um, centers um, or even to the private hospitals and, and so to free up the, the acute hospitals for the actually the sicker patients who are more symptomatic. Um, and, and the idea from, the, from, from this uh, strategy was to, to actually make sure that these patients um, are, are not going to be spreading because we have no clue whether if the PCR is still positive, whether they are still going to be spreading. And, uh, and the assumption has to be that it is since we can't culture the virus. So same, same thing here. We don't culture the virus. We don't go to the virus, we also do PCR. Yeah. Yeah. Same thing in the UK and, and in Germany, I think Prof. Yeah. Banner's saying, we, we are sort of trying to free out the beds for the sicker patients. The other thing we're finding in the UK is a pretty high um, false negative rate with the, the testing. So I know that the, the, the quoted value is sort of 25%, 30%, and a lot of it is put down to sampling error. But I think, so just anecdotally, not, not based on any firm evidence, but I think we, we would comment in the UK that it seems to be higher than that and possibly even up as, as high as sort of 40 odd percent. I don't know um, what you experience in Germany and Hong Kong and Singapore is of, of the testing. I think it's really dependent on the, the sampling technique and so therefore it, it, it's really quite uncomfortable to get a sample because it's really through the nostril all the way in and, and so we actually have trained personnel and not every single person can just go ahead and do the sample. So. So we, we tend to have quite a large uh, uh, positive uh, values. So you've got, you've got designated people to do the test as opposed yeah. to just, okay. They, they have to be trained. They have yeah. to be trained. Yeah. For the test. Okay. Well, that, you see, for Hong Kong, it's a bit different now. We try to do the deep throat saliva. Okay. You don't really need to do this very, I mean, initially when this first started, we do this uncomfortable procedure doing the nasopharyngeal aspirate. But now I think the microbiologists and the IT colleagues, uh, they've, uh, they have uh, reviewed it and noted just doing a deep throat saliva first thing in the morning, which will improve the yield. And it seems that the false negativity rate is very low. You see, once they confirm positive, they would do another one the next day to confirm that it's truly positive. But if it is negative, as I gathered, they don't repeat another one to confirm it's truly negative. Okay, Angela, I'll let you carry on with what you're going to say. And then I've got a few questions that I'd like to put to, to you all that we've had from um, members. So I'll, I'll let you carry on, Angela, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Well, were you going to talk us through the other slides? Uh, you... Okay, uh, yeah, sorry, yeah. So yeah. I'd keep one. <laughs> that's perfect, that's great, thank you. Yeah. If you just make it a presentation again, that's perfect. Um, I don't know whether I should show this because this is actually from, uh, I just want to show a few things to, to do. I mean, Singapore is a bit different from us where, again, they don't advocate masks. But I think for us, uh, talking to our microbiologist, um, I think masks is so useful, even though the surgical masks, um, you know, they can probably block the respiratory droplets up to about five microns, uh, or, you know, um, it might not completely block the uh, COVID-19 because the COVID-19 is even smaller. But the thing is, it can actually help to block the respiratory droplets. So uh, it's actually useful in uh, limiting spread. And, um, and in fact, I, I just want to show this study and the next one, which is from the microbiology in Hong Kong U in my institution, where they show how the, uh, the viral load is actually highest within, as you can see, the first seven days 
uh, of their infection. And um, this is actually a study uh, done by our, my colleague, you know, uh, Yun Guo Yong, who is actually a well-renowned uh, microbiologist, where they look at the temporal profiles of these uh, viral load in the posterior oropharyngeal saliva samples. And as you can see, the uh, viral load is actually highest and uh, gradually uh, reduces with time. So it's a bit, um, their group commented, it's a bit different from the SARS, where the SARS viral load seems to be highest after the first few days or the first week. But for the COVID-19, the viral load is actually highest within the first seven days, which means this is the time where people are most infected. And at the time, because there could be a delay in the presentation, that might lead to a, like why the COVID-19 is spread so easily. And so they emphasize why um, the, you know, uh, wearing the mask actually could help. And, um, and you can see the viral RNA may be detected more than 20, 20 days in the saliva. And also, it seems that whether the disease uh, is mild or severe, it didn't make any difference to the viral load. But rather, age seems to be a factor relating to the viral load. So if you're older, you tend to have a, a, a higher uh, viral load. And then the other thing I want to show whether you, you have read this article, which was just published in JAMA uh, these few days, where there's the MIT group, actually, they um, looked at how uh, the respiratory pathogen might emit. And um, it shows like uh, they use a simulation. Um, and what they found is actually it can be emitted up to uh, seven to eight meters. Um, so therefore, it's so essential to wear a mask because otherwise, I mean, even now we ask people to stay at show social distancing of about 1.5 meter. But if uh, some respiratory pathogen can travel a distance of seven to eight meters, clearly uh, just social distancing might not be able to uh, block off the, um, you know, the, the, the respiratory pathogen uh, emissions into the, um, the different people or the different hosts. So I don't know whether you have, um, you have seen this article, whether I should show it. Um, so no, I hadn't seen it. So no, it's, it's helpful to, to, to show it yet. Yeah, okay. And then uh, finally, I think, uh, whoops. Um, and that's it. And then also this is the article where it shows how the um, COVID-19 stays on the surface, like in, in terms of the plastic and the stainless steel, which stays um, the longest time, and also how the aerosols uh, can actually uh, stay in the air for three hours. And I think these are, I show all these is mainly to indicate why we actually probably should advocate people to wear masks if possible. Though I understand there is a limit, uh, limited supply um, of masks, but I think this is an important way to limit further spread of the infection especially uh, the spread is among close contact. And the other issue is about asymptomatic tra uh, transmission of the virus where people can uh, um, transmit the virus even in the asymptomatic phase. And I think there are different groups looking at uh, people who are asymptomatic and uh, transmit, for instance, from the Princess Diamond, uh, from our Hong Kong ID team and from other uh, uh, China team. And I think the, the asymptomatic transmission varies different publications so some may be about 20 percent 25 percent and sometimes can be up to 50 percent so with this asymptomatic transmission again it's important um that's why we we, we should be uh encouraging uh, you know people to wear masks in order to limit further uh spreading of the infection Okay. And um, so, so, so Prof Lu is, is um, mentioning the, the strategy for dialysis patients. We'd had a, a little bit of a, a conversation about this um, before, you, before you joined. Um, what, what is the strategy in Hong Kong for your dialysis units and your dialysis patients who are infected or at risk of, of infection? Um, yeah, thanks for raising the question. Interesting. We haven't had a patient uh, who are on dialysis getting the infection. You haven't? Um, no, we don't. You see, I think because we all learn from the SARS, yeah. and uh, our patients are actually very scared, you see. So um, as soon as this, this came out, I think most of the dialysis patients actually would uh, uh, stay at home, you know, wear masks. They try to protect themselves from getting their infection. So say in, the, in my unit, and as far as I'm aware, in other units, we don't have dialysis patients coming down with the COVID-19. I don't know uh, the situation in uh, Singapore, but we do have a 
um, a policy, you know, uh, to isolate all the suspicious, uh, suspicious cases or confirmed uh, COVID-19 cases. Angela, when you mean dialysis patients because uh, Hong Kong is PD first, you're talking about peritoneal dialysis patients. No, or I'm talking about so all dialysis. Uh, we have PD first, but we have few dialysis. Um, so, uh, you know, all the dialysis patients, uh, we don't have a, 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 a case. This is quite uh, in contrast to in 2003 when we had a hemodialysis patient spreading the uh, SARS. Um, but uh, now we, we actually don't have, um, I, I think somehow, I mean, like the uh, demographics of our COVID-19 patients is quite different from what you see in um, Europe or, or, or US. Like uh, somehow we didn't, uh, we didn't see a lot of AKI. I must say we, in my center, we don't have someone having AKI. I know that there is one death, uh, uh, I mean, one death from the COVID-19 who had CKD, uh, not dialysis, but I think quite advanced CKD, and eventually he had organ failure. He, he passed away, and uh, that's the only case that need dialysis. So we don't have a lot of um, experience on uh, dialyzing people um, with COVID-19. Well, what about um, Adrian, the peritoneal dialysis patients in Singapore? What's your strategy for management there? Well, so um, we, we don't have any peritoneal dialysis patients with uh, positive COVID-19. We only have one hemodialysis patient. Um, the, the strategy is that um, all positive hemodialysis or dialysis patient will be managed in the acute hospital. They will be isolated there. Um, we have actually dedicated um, one dialysis center to be the home quarantine dialysis center because uh, we would have patients, uh, we, this is in preparation for hemodialysis patients who might have been exposed to, to people with a positive COVID-19 and they need to serve out a 14-day uh, home quarantine. So that center will be decanted um, and they will be serving as the home, national home quarantine analysis um, for the 14 days that the patient is on home quarantine. Um, we have another group of patients who we call the stay home uh, order kind of patients. These are not patients who have been exposed to uh, a positive COVID-19 patient, but these are patients who have just come back from overseas and um, they need to serve out uh, a stay-home order for the next 14 days. So that these people are deemed to be less risk as compared to those who've been exposed to a COVID-positive patient. So these patients will dialyze in the normal uh, hemodialysis center that they dialyze in, um, except that they will wear a surgical mask during the dialysis. So, so that's how we kind of segregate the different types of patients that we have uh, with regards to hemodialysis. So if you don't mind now, I'm just going to go through a couple of the questions that we've had. Um, some of them might be difficult for you to answer because your infection rates are, are so low, but these are to, are to, to you all. Um, so we had a question about um, the consequences for donation. So that, that's a primarily blood donation. So um, Tai Mu Ho has asked if there are any consequences for um, patients who've donated blood before testing was being, or screening testing was being routinely done. So I don't know if in Germany, Hong Kong or Singapore, there's been any sort of party line on whether or not blood donors from pre-testing should still be allowed to, we should still be allowed to use their blood. I suspect the answer is probably not, as in there's not a party line on this, but, um, do any of you have a comment on that? Uh, well, we do. We do because you see, we, the turnaround time for the COVID nineteen for us is only about three to four hours. So, generally, we would do the uh, test before allowing people to donate their bloods. You know. I think from the way it's worded, they're wondering about bloods in, in store, so blood that's been taken as a, a donation before this became or before this gathered gathered pace. So before there was a screening test being done, so if there's blood taken from somebody as a donor in December that's not yet been used, would you discard it or would you use it? Um, I don't think we have a policy of discarding it because we, we, we don't check blood for the virus for the normal people anyway. Yeah. So I'm not sure not that usually, that's... No. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so that, that, that's, um, that, that seems... That, that was what, what, what I would have given as an answer also. Um, now, there's been a lot of... Also... And, uh, but we, uh, we have uh, confirmed, uh, since you mentioned about blood donation, 
uh, we, we, I mean, in Hong Kong, we've already uh, uh, discussed about like using uh, whether the COVID-19, you know, uh, a donor uh, can be used for transplant. And the answer yes. is no, we won't use the uh, positive donor. Yeah, so the, the, the same in the, in the UK. I mean, our transplantation programme has wound down significantly. Um, there are some people who are still being transplanted and um, the, the donor organs at the moment, so if somebody's COVID-19, the organ is not used. And if somebody is a suspected COVID-19, then the organ is also not used. Um, the same in Germany? Same thing. And um, every centre has a different policy in terms of how active they are in the moment in going into transplantation. The youngest uh, with a very good fit uh, of a good organ will be transplanted, the elderly a little bit reluctant. So Christoph, can I just check whether you uh, proactively check a donor for COVID-19 if they are asymptomatic and no exposure before uh, transplant? Yes, uh, they are all tested, but uh, this. Uh, but I don't know whether the result is arriving before they get uh, their transplant. So this, I don't know in the moment. But I, I, they get all the tests. Yes. Now, um, this this may be um, less straightforward. There, there's a lot of interest in acute kidney injury in. COVID-19. So a lot of interest in the numbers of patients developing acute kidney injury and the number of patients who are requiring renal replacement therapy and what type of renal replacement therapy that should be, whether it should just be standard dialysis or SLED, for example. Um, do you have any thoughts, any of you, about this or any experience? Um, Angela, you obviously mentioned one case um, where the patient sadly passed away, but I, I don't know if um, I think probably because you're, you're earlier on in, in the curve, you maybe don't have as much experience as, as, as for example, Italy and Spain. But I don't know what your thoughts are about acute kidney injury, the mechanism and, and what the incidence of it is. Prof. Anner? Maybe I can, I can answer because we have some data in Germany sure. and reports from several universities. Aachen is currently uh, has 70 patients under ventilation and 50% are on renal replacement therapy. And they, if you have 35 and you run out of machines, you do all a mix of, um, of continuous uh, treatment or uh, standard dialysis. So whatever you can provide, usually intensive care units in the uh, anesthesiologist or surgery hands, they are very well trained in doing continuous renal replacement therapy. So we have a very high rate about in, in Würzburg as well, 50% with acute kidney injury, acute renal failure. And our discussion point is in the moment that maybe we get an enrichment of these complicated patients. They even are flown in from Bergamo, Italy, uh, from France um, to use our capacities. And they are the complicated cases. Uh, I only can cite the Wuhan paper where they found 6% dialysis incidence, but 40% acute kidney injury with proteinuria and, and nephrotic syndrome. But here in, in, in Germany, in most places, 50% of all uh, intubated and ventilated patients uh, require uh, RRT. So 50% of your ventilated patients requiring RRT. Could, could be enrichment, yeah, because yeah. the major centers get referrals. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Now, um, the answer from our webinar the other day to this question was no. But ha have any of you um, had a patient who's had a kidney biopsy with COVID-19? No. 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 We ask. We ask around. No experience. Um, my answer is: I saw 500 patients with Hunter virus uh, infection and acute kidney injury in the last 20 years. This is endemic here in Würzburg. We did biopsies. We see interstitial nephritis with uh, scar bleedings uh, in, in interstitium. So I would be very interesting how these uh, corona and SARS will look like in the kidney. Yeah, absolutely. Angela, did you want to pass comment about um, acute kidney injury? You looked as though you were going to say something. Um, no, I actually, in my, I mean, I, I, we reviewed the uh, cases in my center, honestly. I mean, the creatinine was kind of up to about uh, Hundred and I mean, no one actually have the grasp about the 130 micro micromoles per liter. In fact, um, they don't have AKI. I think because most of our cases are actually quite stable. 
Yeah. Okay. Wow. And, and Adrian, you, you were shaking your head. Uh, well, no. So uh, our AKI you, it occurs in the setting of multi-organ failure. So That's most of them are ventilated um, in ICU and, and we use CRRT. So again, it depends on the resources. So, so CRRT, when we have it, if not, it will just be standardized or slack. Okay. Yeah. And um, so, so Prof Anna, are you able to comment on um, how many of these patients recover their kidney function? No, not yet. I don't know. Yeah. Um, actually, this would be um, was also a question I asked to the registry, but this requires some uh, long term follow up. Uh, what happens after three months? And uh, I'm screening the literature. The first cases should come from Wuhan. They should have the first uh, papers. Yeah. I just uh, saw today a paper in uh, JAMA Cardiology where they report about the myocardial damage and the hydroponin oh, yeah. T. So I think we get from all these uh, end organ damage and long-term follow-up in the upcoming weeks. Yeah. Um, now, we had a question on Instagram, which was nice. We don't, we don't have a huge following on Instagram, so we were pleased that somebody engaged on Instagram. Um, so the question from Instagram was, um, has any of you got any experience of hemoperfusion in uh, COVID-19? No. No. Actually, we do in many units these endotoxin filters to absorb uh, cytokines, IL-6 uh, and other things. Um, we have occasionally reports of miracles. Uh, I personally, I am not a fan of these uh, extra corporal removal of uh, cytokines because the distribution volume is so large and and the absorption capacity, even if you change the thousand dollar filter every day, um, I, I want to see a good, a good controlled study, a good paper. We use it, we do this type of hemoperfusion, so uh, endotoxin absorption in many, many units, big business, but where are the data? So I think that that's a very pertinent question for a lot of the treatments that are being touted at the moment. We had a, a, a long discussion about this um, on Monday at our, at our first webinar, um, talking about hydroxychloroquine, tocilizumab. Um, in Italy, um, Umberto Maggiore was talking about the use of colchicine. Um, Maria Soler was talking to us about the use of um, hydro, uh, hydroxychloroquine as a prophylactic treatment. There's a study in Spain currently looking at that. What, what are Germany using? Are Germany, when they're, when they're opting for um, a, a treatment, are they going for um, endemosphere? Or are they going for colchicine? What, what, um, what's the, the, the German stance at the moment? You see, uh, Germany is listening uh, to the daily webcast of our national virologist, which gives us uh, an education. And he even did a journal club on the chloroquine paper and um, actually the result is we need uh, better controlled studies and we do not believe in chloroquine and nobody is using it because um, this webcast uh, of very high quality is seen by a lot of journalists or and they cannot write um, strange stories um, and we this is this is a very good instrument a national education where we can avoid uh, uh, walking in the wrong direction. Uh, actually, the, the antiviral therapy, what is used in different parts, I'm, I cannot comment about. I don't know. No. Adrian or Angela, do you have anything to say about, about therapies? Well, I think at most the, the, the therapy that we use is antiretroviral therapy, but mm -hmm. that's at, at most that we use. I, we don't think, I don't think we have used chloroquine or cochicine. Yeah, okay. And Angela, are you, are you um, like for Hong Kong? We I think um, they are doing clinical trials. Uh, so uh, they actually use antiviral. Uh, they use the uh, Kaletra mm -hmm. and uh, the other arm. They use Kaletra, interferon, beta, and uh, rubavirin. And I think our ID colleagues seem to feel that the beta interferon is actually quite crucial in the treatment regime. In um, uh, you know, uh, helping the uh, virus to evade the innate uh, immune system, um, which is, seems to be even more important than the Kaletra. And in fact, uh, we, we actually see quite good response uh, to the treatment. But I, I mean, they are under clinical trials, so, so it's uh, 
we still wait to see the results. And then the other trial they are doing is uh, using the uh, ran, uh, the uh, Gilead start, uh, drug, ran, ran, Mistervia. Okay. Um, so can I, can I just maybe ask, uh, Maria Soler has, has um, passed comment on the chat about biopsies. Maria, are you there? Maria, are you, are you, are you still there? Maybe not. So, she, so, so Maria has commented that there's apparently a preprint with biopsies, um, a, so a Chinese preprint, and apparently they've um, described only ATN at the moment. So that's a bit of an update um, for people that have been asking about biopsies. Uh, and we've also got another question here from, um, oh, there's, oh, Maria, maybe not there. Um, so Shibarti Carr, I don't know if you would like to ask your question, Dr. Carr. Maybe not. Okay, so Dr. Carr is asking, should we raise our voice to enhance the coordination among global leaders as if we want to eradicate from the world every country should take its part as well? So I think that's, I think that question is, is alluding to should we get together and um, try and have everybody coordinating the efforts against COVID-19? I think that's probably what people are trying to do. I think, but yeah. with, the, with the help of the US or what do you mean? Uh, so, so this is not my question. So, I can, all I can do is read it. Um, Dr. Carr, are, do you, would you like to pass comment? If you unmute your microphone, you'd be able to enter the discussion with our panelists. Uh, yeah, Dr. Carr doesn't want to. Yeah, so, so I guess it, it's, it's with everybody. Although, obviously, um, the, the U.S. stance has been a little bit controversial. But we, I, I think uh, quite a number of countries are collaborating and they are sharing data and they're sharing information as well as strategies. Um, at, at least among the Southeast Asian countries, I think we're all sharing uh, what we're doing. We're sharing information about patients who've been uh, from other countries within, their, you know, within the region and, and you know, sending back information back to the, to the various governments. So, so it's happening in bits and pocket. Yeah, I think I, th I would say that, that, that my you know experience and from what I've seen is a pretty good collegiate effort going on. Um, people have managed to get some trials up and running fairly quickly. We've got three that that we can recruit into in, in the UK, including the the recovery trial. Um, we're recruiting into the same one that, that you mentioned, Angela, using interferon beta um, and then low dose dexamethasone. There's been quite a lot of interest about steroids because I think that um, in previous um, cases of coronavirus, not necessarily COVID-19, the, the use of steroid has been associated with no benefit and perhaps making things worse. But now there's um, some debate as to whether or not perhaps pulse steroids might be um, of benefit here, particularly for the respiratory, um, the AR ARDS. Um, but I, I would say that you know, the, 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 the ERA have a registry where they're trying to gather data from countries. And I think people do seem to be, as you've said, trying hard to have a kind of combined fight against this. Angela, Christoph, you're nodding. Yeah, I, I see one major effort currently even discussed in the press uh, and in daily uh, newsletters, the, the, the discussion about reconvalescent plasma and how yeah. to get um, um, enriched uh, plasma, hyperimmune globulins and sera from the industry uh, because you need thousands of liters of plasma in a, in a big company to produce these products. Uh, but uh, it's discussed, everybody wants to donate, but we uh, need to have a good antibody test and the antibody test will come next week or in two weeks. It's not yet there, a good validated test. And uh, furthermore, we need a good test for neutralizing antibodies. And then when all this is available, I think then uh, one major plasma industry may be ready to accept these uh, antibody positive uh, donations and produce a product for later on this year. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's interesting, you know, when you talked about the drug treatment, because uh, the I mentioned about the microbiologist in my institution, who's well renowned, uh, Professor Yun. So um, he actually is very interesting. You might go onto the website because he developed a hamster animal model for the COVID nineteen, where he can actually do all the um, not only looking at the uh, pathogenesis of the uh, of the lung injury, you know, uh, and most importantly 
he can uh, test the different treatments in the animal model to see how well it works before translating or testing it in humans. Um, so I think he just said this paper published in one of the big, big journals. Um, so worthwhile looking because I think he developed, this is probably the first animal, I mean, uh, animal model. Uh, uh, to reproduce the code. Whoops, it's a. Uh, no, it's okay, you're, you're back. The website looks a bit unstable. Yeah. 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 And, yeah. Sorry. And, and then, then also, I think, Christian, about the um, antibody, I think this is also being looked into um, in, in my uh, institution, uh, the ID team in the microbiology. I think that holds promise because I think this was actually also used um, when we had the SARS outbreak. Uh, in 2003, where we try to use the antibody in the very sick patients. So, like again, the antibody testing is the, I mean, the, the use of the uh, uh, convalescent sera uh, of the uh, COVID 19 patients are also uh, in more severe disease patients. Um, okay, so I'm aware that time is ticking on and it's, it's obviously late in Hong Kong and, and Singapore. So I've just got two, two more points. Um, so the first relates to testing healthcare workers. So um, in Germany, Hong Kong, Singapore, do you have a policy for screening healthcare workers? No. No, we don't. Um, in fact, we only screen if they are, if no, they are symptomatic. Don't. We are already short That's of right. healthcare workers not one the asymptomatic one to be <laughs> okay. positive and it becomes a stigma and yeah. and, and we ran out of healthcare workers no but this is an excellent question it's discussed in the german society in nephrology because we have a center in uh, some parts of germany which have 40 infected dialysis patients and the infection came in from healthcare workers and the discussion is whether to test them all or uh, put them on on and this is looks like a joke continuous quarantine uh, so long as they are working with the patient yeah um, and i suppose in, in relation to the last point we were discussing an igg test would be helpful here because potentially we could be looking to test our healthcare workers and maybe offer them some reassurance if they you know have, have produced an antibody and if we think that confers immunity and um, but I, I guess that's coming so, so the final um, point is a, is a basic science point, um, and it relates to um, the ACE inhibitor um, angiotensin 2 receptor blocker debate, which we covered a little bit again on Monday. So it's really a kind of three-part question, and it comes from Jose Maria Barreros from Spain. So asking, what role do you think angiotensin 2 plays in the poor lung evolution of patients with COVID-19? And um, do you think that the possible beneficial effect of angiotensin 2 receptor blockers might be due to an increase in ACE or to the blocking of angiotensin at the AT1 receptor? What do you think? think the short answer probably is the jury is out and no, nobody really knows. Yeah. I'm interested in your opinion. I think we need a randomized, I think we, we all these observational data, you know, and postulations, I think we need um, more data. Yeah, I think I think that's um, yeah, it, it's an interesting. This point. is also I, well, I think there was an article uh, coming out from um, Scott Solomon, like the cardiologist John yeah. McMurray's, you know, in the New England Journal of Medicine. I think it's very premature to uh, make a conclusion about the use of the RAS blockades in uh, COVID nineteen case. And yeah. sorry, Chris, I've only. The, the evidence is, is not strong. It's, it's very limited data. And I think that we just need to be very careful that you are um, substituting an infection outbreak with a pandemic of cardiovascular disease and atrial and failure and, and, and strokes. So, so I think we need to be very careful about um, advocating um, against this uh, topic, actually. Yeah, the and, data. and the European Society of Hypertension, together with the European Society of Cardiology, they have already made statements uh, in this direction, analyzing what you said, Adrian, and uh, their recommendation is not to stop. Yeah. yeah so, so we, um, we, we, we discussed this, as I say, again on, on Monday. And so uh, Spain, Italy, Sweden all, all, all agree. And I, I think there's... Um, there's pretty good evidence, exactly as you said, Adrian, that we shouldn't be just randomly stopping these drugs. Um, uh, Prof. Paddy Mark, who I'm sure you know, spoke a little bit about this on Monday, and um, he'd said that 
the only time you would advocate stopping them would be if somebody had an AKI and you'd be stopping them anyway for, for that reason um, at present, which I think seemed very sensible, sage advice. So I'd like to, to thank the three of you very much indeed for uh, coming, coming on. Um, at the beginning, we mentioned this will be on our website, so we'll make sure that you have the link um, and you, know, you can put it on to um, any other website that you, that you wish to share it with. Um, there may be some other questions that come in and we, we might um, drop you a wee email if we have any other specific questions for you. But everything you said today has been extremely helpful. It's, and it's very interesting, I think, particularly to hear how, how different places are doing things a little bit differently. Um, in Europe, I think there's been a bit of a panic, whereas in Hong Kong, it sounds that you've been a bit more controlled perhaps about it, perhaps because of your experience of, of um, SARS in 2003, which clearly was, uh, was, was terrible. Um, anything that you would like to say before we, we sign off? Oh, so sorry we are late. Uh, I, I think it's daylight saving. So we were actually, um, this is actually the time that we're supposed to come in. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I thought we are supposed to come in at nine o'clock. Um, so 12.45 <laughs> our time, which is 8.45 your time. It's fine. It doesn't matter. It's informal. It's going on the website and people will be able to see it. So we're, we're delighted. We're just delighted you're here. It doesn't matter that you missed right. the beginning. Although it's a pleasure being here. Yeah, you can, you can watch mm -hmm. both others bit on, online. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes, thank you very thank much. You. Bye, Christina. Bye. 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 Bye.